Welcome to FBC. Thanks for tuning in. We pray that you will allow God's Word to speak to you, to encourage you, and transform your life. Thanks for watching. Title of the message this morning, Responding to the Call of God. Responding to the Call of God as revealed in the life of Moses. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 22, uh, very shortly. I just need to add a few things here as we get underway. Uh, last July, I brought a message in this chapter, July 23rd to be exact. Uh, we conducted a deep dive, what I would call a deep dive into the life of Moses that included, of course, his birth, his upbringing, uh, his uh, time of being reared in the palace of Pharaoh, of course, the burning bush, and the call of God to return to Egypt to confront Pharaoh. Uh, we'll not be retracing those steps today. Uh, perhaps a number of you were here, you, you recall that message. We will pick up the account in verse 11. Uh, last July 23rd, we were verses 1 through 10, so we're going to be Picking up in verse 11 through the end of the chapter, our focus is, is really upon the call of God, more so than the life of Moses, although uh, we can't miss his life on a day uh, like today. Uh, important to note as we get underway that in the life of Moses, we see ourselves. And uh, I'm not here today to pile on Moses. Uh, we're not here to do that. After all, we see, we see us in him. And uh, I hope that uh, you will come to see that as well. Uh, at this point, and by this point, I'm talking verse 11, uh, Moses has been to the bush. And God has given him his marching orders. And to put it mildly, Moses is reluctant, reluctant to move out in obedience to the call of God. And like Moses, we tend to be reluctant when we embrace the call of God. Begin reading verse 11. I'm going to invite you to stay right where you're at. There are only 11 verses here, uh, but they are packed with a lot of content. I want you to be comfortable. I want you to be focused on the screen with every sentence that is read because we're going to be coming back to some, some important points in the text. Beginning verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation. The generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery into Egypt, into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go 
unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all of the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people. So that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. And so concludes the reading of God's holy word. So we get underway here this morning, a few important notes to share with you. Number one, the living God in all of his sovereignty does not need to work in and through the lives of people to accomplish his will. But he does. The call of God can be seen in terms of two separate calls, and this is very important. You want to take particular note of this. The first call is a universal call to salvation through the atoning work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. It's the shed blood applied to our lives by faith uh, that wipes our sin record clean. It's a universal call to all with the choice to either respond or not to respond. And then there is a second call, a less than universal call. It is a call for service, sometimes referred to as a special call or a special calling. Now, a misunderstanding has long circulated that God only calls pastors and missionaries for service. And that is a very narrow and an incomplete understanding of the call of God. Throughout Scripture, we're only talking about Scripture here. Throughout Scripture, God has called some to be kings. And ironically, others to confront kings. He's called some to be priests, prophets, judges, and apostles. Some to be deliverers. Some great military leaders, some to be administrators, and some even heads of state. All working, key word there, all, all working to advance his will, his plans, his agenda. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. His will, his plan, his agenda. God may never call you to be a pastor or a missionary. In fact, he may, may never call you to confront Pharaoh back in Egypt. He may, however, call you to serve on a school board, on a city council, on a board or a commission. Yours truly sits on the historical and cultural commission for the city of Grove City. There are 14 boards and commissions. I'm in the third year of a three-year term appointed by the mayor of Grove City on the Historical and Cultural Commission. Plenty of opportunity for God to call people. God may call you, however, to serve in an industry or a specific field or even in an institution. Maybe it's a nonprofit organization or it's to head up a special cause or interest. Or perhaps in the government somewhere, or in the legal system, banking and finance, or in some other capacity, only God knows. Only God knows. All called of God to be used of God in a great way to advance his agenda at a time and place of his choosing. Moses is no different. No different. He is an unlikely individual living at an unlikely time, in an unlikely place, and in the midst of an unlikely career path, and on the verge of being called to an unlikely task. 
mask. Remove his name and insert another name, maybe even your own. It was Mark Twain. We all know Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said that the two most important days in the life of a person are the day they are born and the day they discover the reason why. Moses is about to find out the answer to the reason why. God calls unlikely people. There's a lot of those in this room. There's one of them on this platform right now. He calls unlikely people. He prepares them in an unlikely fashion and that at an appointed time and place. He commissions them to accomplish a great and yet an unlikely task. The call of God will always find you. You need not go looking for it or searching for it. You need not lose sleep at night wondering, have I missed God's call? important to note Moses does not miss the bush he does not miss the bush the bush finds him God will find you God will find you in fact if you were to lose sleep at night it would be because you would be concerned that you would not respond promptly and obediently to the call now that would make sense But you need not go searching for it. In fact, when we do that, it usually ends very badly. It ended badly for Moses at age 40 when he tried to insert his life into the role of the deliverer of the Hebrew people. Uh, It doesn't work well. And as we're moving into the meat of the message here this morning, the final thing we want to look at is the call of God is irrevocable. If that phone rings and God is on the other end of the line, you need to know it's irrevocable. There are no exemptions. There are no college deferments. There is no hiding out in Canada or Great Britain. You can run, you can always do that. You do have that option, you can run, but you can't hide. You'd want to ask Jonah about that. I'm sure he'd have plenty to share with you on that subject. But the reluctance of Moses is well chronicled. As I said a few moments ago, we're not here to pile on Moses. Um, We see ourselves in him. Uh, This was very difficult for him, and it's very difficult for us, uh, if we were completely honest. We're going to look at seven things. You'll see them in the slides. Seven reasons why this is difficult. I believe it's very important we come to terms with this before the phone rings. Number one, why is this so difficult? It's because of our reluctance to leave our comfort zone behind we give up control when we step away from our comfort zone oh that's the rub we just love control we give up control it makes us nervous makes us want to fret we become like a cat on a hot tin roof if God is to accomplish anything great in and through your life, pack your bags. You're leaving your comfort zone. And that leads us to number two. Why is this so difficult? It's our tendency to lean on our own understanding. I'm pretty sure God's word has something to say about that. In fact, his word says, don't do that. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your steps. But we just love to trust our judgment. There's one word that describes that. Mistake. Mistake. And this is not only with the call of God. This is, this is with God's leading in your life, hour by hour, day by day. When we lean on our own understanding, it eventually has devastating consequences. 
I love the illustration of the keyhole in the door. Yes, we can see some things, but we don't see the, the big picture. Our understanding is greatly limited. In fact, not only that, but it's deeply flawed. God's ways are perfect. Say no more. Number three, why is this so difficult? It's our preoccupation with obstacles in our path. If you were here last July 23rd, I talked a little bit about obstacles. If God is to accomplish anything great through our lives, there will be obstacles. In fact, some of you probably have obstacles at this moment in your life. Maybe with a marriage or in your family, finances, legally, at work, uh, with neighbors in your community. Uh, obstacles all over the place. Uh, if God is going to accomplish something through us, Get used to it. Expect them. Count on it. Look at it this way. An obstacle is always an occasion to trust God. As if we need occasions to do that. It's always an occasion to trust God and then to revel in his glory. See, when we trust him, we get the benefit of reveling in his glory. Obstacles are never our problem. When the call of God comes to your life, they're his problem. My family, the first family pastor that we claim after my parents were saved in 1969, lived his life this way, just fully yielded to God. And everywhere he went, wherever there was an obstacle, it was always, God, you have a problem. You have a problem. He was from New Jersey. He was on his way in the early 70s to Kansas, West Kansas, for revival meetings. No cell phones in 1972. Car breaks down out there in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. He was supposed to be speaking in four hours. So he just went out, pulled off the interstate, went out and sat, leaned up against the front of the car, the hood of the car, folded his arms and said, God, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. Within a matter of minutes, a tow truck driver came, said, what's the problem? Where are you headed? He says, I'm headed to this town on the other side of Kansas. I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm on my way for revival meetings. He says, well, that's interesting. I'm from that same town. He says, I had to haul a vehicle all the way out here. Uh, in fact, he says, I'm a member of that church. Let me, let me hook your car up to my tow truck. I'll tow it back, towed it back. Repaired all of his engine work for free. In fact, at the end of the revival meetings, the guy said, I noticed you had a little bit of rust. We also have a, a body in the paint department. We took care of that for you as well. When you trust God with obstacles, you revel in his glory. Amen. Number four, why is this so difficult? It's the tendency to trust our feelings. In short order, our feelings just can't be trusted. They're not reliable. And yet we make decisions every day based upon how we feel. You know, that's where the term buyer's remorse comes from. Are you familiar with buyer's remorse? Usually with big ticket items, houses, cars, vacation plans. Uh, we're feeling really good about those things. And then we sign on the dotted line and then our feelings change. Boy, how quickly they change. Buyer's remorse. Moses has a decision to make. And so do the called today. We must decide whether we're going to trust the living God or our feelings. Decision to make. Number five, why is this so difficult? It's our preoccupation or our obsession with our own insecurities. Our own insecurities. That's our weaknesses, our shortcomings. Past failures, things you have done, things people have done to you. Present struggles. Low self-esteem. We can become paralyzed by who we think we are. 
you know, there's two subsets of people generally in the kingdom. There's the first subset that, oh, I can't do that. God can't use me. I don't have any skills. I don't have any gifts. Don't ask me to do that. I don't offer anything. Then there's the other subset that thinks they're more important to God than they really are. And what is God left with? He's left with that narrow subset of people that say, Lord, I don't offer you much, but everything I have is yours. You want to use me? You want to send me? You want to work in me and through me for your glory? Lord, please do it. And that's who God generally has to work with. You know what God says to Moses in, in, in so many ways? He says to us, he says, I know all about your insecurities. I know all about those things. And actually, there's a few more, by the way. I don't care about that. He says, I'm the sovereign God. I have chosen you. He says, I have chosen you. It's not your strength or your power or your charm or your good looks or your intellect or your diplomas that hang on the wall that are going to decide the outcome of the call. It's God's strength and God's power in his glory. Number six, why is this so difficult? Uh, it's because of our struggle in trusting God in difficult situations. How do you do in that area of your life? You want a quick measuring stick? You want a quick barometer of where you're at spiritually in your life? How do you do trusting God in difficult situations? We need to get used to it. Men and women of God are made. They're not born. Now hear me. They are born again. We're not talking about that. We're talking about maturity. Men and women of God are made, that is, they're forged and they're galvanized by learning to trust God in difficult situations. How do you do in that area? Always appreciate the college football coaches and the college basketball coaches that play a tough non-conference schedule. You know why they do that? They want their teams to be ready and mature and strong for the competition at the end of the season. They're willing to take a nick. They're willing to lose a game. If their team learns from that, becomes stronger and advances. God uses difficult situations to prepare his people for future difficult situations. You may say, I'm going through something and it's strange and now something else has surfaced. Uh, who knows? God may be preparing you for something great. I do say this, if you want to be used of God in a great way, be prepared to trust him when the heat's on because it's going to get hot. It's going to get hot. Number seven, why do we struggle? Why is this so difficult? It's our struggle to believe that God would ever decide to use us in a great way. Why would God ever choose to use me in a great way. Do you know how I answer that question? With a question. Why not? Why not? Who am I to question God's judgment? Always like the book of Job. We, we usually miss out on this part. Uh, Job did pretty well. It ends very well for him. Uh, but he, he doesn't get an A+. Uh, you know, he, he complained to God. And you know what God does? God pushes back. Do you realize we serve a God who pushes back? He does. God pushes back. And I paraphrase. Don't quote me on this. I paraphrase. He says to Job, uh, Job, where were you when I spoke creation into existence? Where were you when I hung the sun, and the stars, and the moon? Where were you, Job? It would be real easy for him to say that to me. I don't have Job's resume. The poet Alfred Lord Tennyson, great poet, 19th century. His great work, The Charge of the Light Brigade. I paraphrase again. Ours is not to reason why. Ours is only to do or die. 
So where does that leave Moses? Where does it leave us today? Should the phone ring by the end of the day for us? God's plan for Moses is also his plan for the called today. You want to take note of that? It'll be up on the screen here shortly. I call it a template. This is a template. If God calls you to something great, it's the same template he used for Moses. Seven things God agrees to do for Moses, he will do for you. Should your phone ring sometime this week. Number one, he says, I will be with you. That's coming from verse 12, and that's verbatim. Uh, By the way, God's presence is the gold standard. The gold standard. His presence always assures success. It always guarantees victory. His presence is the hallmark of the card of the call. If I were to be called for a great assignment, the first thing I want to know, God, are you going to be with me? And that's the first thing he assures Moses with. He knows that his knees are wobbling. Uh, It's a good thing they're wobbling. You know what that means? He's positioned for God to use him in a great way. His knees weren't wobbling at age 40. If your knees are wobbling, uh, God can work with that. But the hallmark of the call is God's presence. With God, we're always the majority. Leads to number two. He says, I will give you assurance of my plan. Now, he doesn't say that verbatim. What he does say is this will be your sign. This will be your sign. I'm going to bring you after this is all said and done. I'm going to bring you back to this mountain. And you're going to worship me right here. That will be your sign. I thought this is a wonderful illustration of one of the character, characteristics of the God we serve. He is accommodating. He is accommodating. You remember Gideon in the book of Judges? Gideon says, well, uh, uh, verify this for me one more time. Uh, give me a fleece. Let me put out a fleece. Uh, God accommodates him, goes overboard, I think, to accommodate Gideon. And uh, he knows that, the, that a call will not be easy for you. And he's always up to giving you assurance of the call. Uh, this will be your sign. He, he is marvelous at accommodating us. I think oftentimes we see God up, up there with a big sledgehammer wanting to come down on top of us. Just the opposite. He is incredibly accommodating. Leads us to number three. He says, I will tell you what to say. Verse 4, he says, I will tell you what to do. Those are two of the greatest hang-ups to men and women today responding to the call of God. What will I say and what will I do? You know what God is saying to Moses in essence? He says, I've got it all covered. I've got it all covered. I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to tell you what to do. Verse 14, he says, tell them the great I am is sending you. They'll get that. Verse 16, he says, go to the elders, mobilize them, and then head for Pharaoh and his court in Egypt. When the call of God comes to your life, he will tell you what to say. Whether it's at City Hall on Broadway, at the United States Supreme Court, with the national networks, or at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He will tell you what to do. He will tell you what to say. That leads us to number five. He says, I will deliver the people. Moses, you're not going to deliver the people, Moses. That's my job. I'm going to deliver the people, Moses. This is my call. That doesn't rest on your shoulders, Moses. It's on mine. At the heart and the soul and the core of the call is that the call rests on God's shoulders. He will deliver the people. He will deliver you in whatever circumstance you find yourself. Verse 17, he says, out of their misery, I will lead them into a new land. God is saying, I'm going to pull this off. 
The term, you know what term I like? I'm going to do the heavy lifting. You don't have to fret about that. You don't have to lose one minute of sleep about how this is all, how this will come to pass. He says, I'm going to pull this off. Verse, or number six, verse 20. He says, I will act on your behalf. I think we lose sight of the understanding that God acts on our behalf. He says, I will stretch forth my hand against the Egyptians. If need be, God will get involved hot and heavy. If need be, he's going to find himself right in the middle of the fray. Now, this is not one of the pagan deities. This is the living God who spoke all of creation into being. He says, I will act on your behalf. And number seven, wraps it up with a bow. He says, I will give you favor among the Egyptian people. You will plunder them. They will give you riches just to leave the country. Silver, gold, and fine linen. What a deal. What a bargain. God will give you favor where necessary and when necessary. And he will change the minds of judges, of administrators, of juries, of politicians, people who work in credit departments and banks and financial institutions. Wherever necessary, he'll give you favor. God's plan for Moses is his plan for us. I will be with you. I will give you assurance. I will tell you what to say. I will tell you what to do. I will deliver the goods. I will act on your behalf. And I will give you favor. I've got it all covered. So we end today. These were all things that God told Moses he would do for him. And I really believe these, this is a template of what God will do for us. But he's asking for something in return. There's always something in return. God asks of Moses and he asks of the called. These five are particularly important. I have no idea whether your phone will ring this week. And whether the living God's going to be on the other line. Five things. Abandon your life to me. Let go of everything. Write it off. Write it off. Another way of saying that is my wishes, my plans, and my ambitions at my feet in ashes lay. Number two, he says, trust my leading. Trust my leading. Accept it. Don't question it. And don't reject it. And number three, right at the center, right at the center, obey my directions. Obedience is always at the center of the call. Obey my directions. Don't delay. Don't deviate. Don't revise the plan or change the ending or change the wording. And when I say to move, get moving. It's important to note that delayed obedience remains disobedience. Number four, this is often a hang up. Receive my provision. How is this going to work? How are we going to go from X amount of dollars a month down to this amount of money coming in? Uh, What about my health care? What about this? What about that? God says, receive my provision. Where God leads, he always keeps. When you answer the call, you always go with his American Express card. And number five. Leave the outcome and the results in my hands. Resist the urge to interfere with what I am doing. And boy, that's difficult. We mentioned a while ago, we love control. We love our own judgment. We love our own judgment. Resist the urge to interfere with with what I am doing. In other words, trust, obey, and get out of the way. Who knows? Perhaps God intends to use you in a great way at a time and a place of his choosing. 
to advance his agenda. Perhaps the call of God will be to you at a time such as this. And I really believe we're living in a time such as this. Amen. As you see prophecy being fulfilled, the church is being persecuted in America. When the living God is on the other end of that line, how are we to respond? Was the songwriter Lynn Kiesecker. I want to give Lynn credit for this. God used him. One of the great worship anthems that's been out there for a few decades. I'll say, yes, Lord, yes. How do I believe he wants us to respond this way? I'll say, yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way. I'll say, yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, our prayer this morning is that when that call comes, that you'll prepare us to say yes to your will and to your way. That you'll help us to remember that we're, we're merely an instrument in your hands. That the success of this call does not rest on our shoulders. It belongs to you. That you'll help us to remember that your ways are perfect. And that you can be trusted every step of the way. And what you're looking for, ultimately, is obedience to your leading. Remind us again that the results rest in your hands. For it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. The invitation this morning is threefold. If God has been speaking to you about being available to his call, you come. If you want to punctuate your availability to a future call, you come. If you've not answered that first call, the call to salvation, God's word says today is the day of salvation. Not, not next Wednesday. You come. If you have needs in your life or burdens, you want to pray for someone, you come as well. Thanks for watching today's message. If you have any questions or comments or if you made a decision for Christ, please reach out to us at info at firstgc.org. That's info at firstgc.org. Thanks again for watching.